We're continuing to look at Daisy, and I'm jumping forward from the end of Chapter 4 to Chapter 8. So we're going from when Nick and Jordan discuss the early relationship of Gatsby and Daisy, and this is what Nick reports us to us that Jordan tells her. These are Jordan's memories. But now we get an insight into what Gatsby actually saw. So... It was this night that he told me the strange story of his youth with Dan Cole, Cody. Told it to me because Jay Gatsby had broken up like glass against Tom's hard malice. There, the idealist running into the realist, that representation of the American dream as being hard and unyielding when it's in the hands of people like Tom, and that the fragility of Gatsby's desires is broken up easily in the in the when it comes confronts that hard reality. And the long secret extravaganza was played out. Um, notice the word extravaganza here, that idea of a performance, the great Gatsby. But this is how he saw Daisy in his youth. Um, I think that he would have acknowledged anything now without reserve but he wanted to talk about Daisy. So rather than tell us about his dealings, the reality of his wealth and all those things, he talks about the one thing that drove him. There's some really interesting words in this section to describe Daisy, but also what Fitzgerald is revealing to us about the nature of dreams and how we might trick or fool ourselves and try to make them appear to be something that they can never actually be. And we'll jump back to chapter 5 and look at a really great quotation later. So she was the first nice girl he had ever known. Now, we don't actually know whether nice is euphemistic or whether this is the specific term that Gatsby uses. I would probably go with that because that idea of quotation marks to be a euphemism is a more modern idea. However, in various unrevealed capacities, he had come in contact with such people, but always with indiscernible barbed wire between. Now, this description of the barrier between himself, nice people, whatever nice might be, and this is this euphemistic idea of whether nice might actually mean wealthy, um, the barbed wire is that separation between the classes. It's very much that why you might see it in a, in a war zone, that the classes were actually at war, that the um, fence had been put up to keep out the lower classes, and that you would be hurt if you tried to cross over in some way because you were not welcome. He finds her excitingly desirable. So exciting and desirable, not quite the same as love, doesn't necessarily make him feel good. He wants to possess her because that possession is an exciting possibility, a dream, a fantasy, something to drive him. He goes to her house at first with other officers, but then he goes uh, later on his own. And what he notes about her is this beautiful house. It's no wonder then he buys this uh, mansion so that he can look over at her dock and also try to impress her with his own opulent lifestyle. This air of breathless intensity is not dissimilar to the exciting desirability of Daisy. Uh, Daisy lived there. Um, she treats her wealth in a very casual way, in the same way he dismisses the tent in which he lives and the vastness between their living conditions is exaggerated there. There was a ripe mystery and this word ripe, this sexual desire, this possibility of taking her and consuming her and then being nourished by her is reinforced by this idea of ripeness but also this mystery what might I get? How might I be fulfilled? What could I achieve if I had her? This idea of hint, the hint of bedrooms upstairs, relates to that ripeness as well. 
uh, I think this is quite interesting. It relates to this idea of vitality. Uh, there were romances that were not musty and laid away already in lavender. This idea of being memories and dead and needing to be made to smell better than they really are. They're fresh and breathing and redolent of this year's shining motor cars and of dancers whose flowers were scarcely withered. And I've got lots of references to flowers, which we know is a consistent symbol throughout the novel, and they have certain meaning. In this case, lavender is associated with age and death, whereas flowers that hadn't withered and are bright are like cars, mobility and now, and the mechanical possibilities in this age are related to the blossoming flowers. It excited him too that many men had already loved Daisy. Well, that's interesting. Because when he finds out that she has a daughter, it becomes a crushing reality. Whereas here, he celebrates this idea of her being a woman who is highly prized because she becomes more valuable. If you have what everyone else has, then you've made it. And that's echoing that promise of the dream, that we're all pursuing this one idea, this one ambition of wealth and happiness in the American context. I'm jumping a little bit forward here, but he knew that he was in Daisy's house by a colossal accident. It's interesting, it comes so closely with this idea of cars. And we know that Jordan tells us and Nick reminds us that it takes two to create an accident and by putting this realistic wealthy woman next to this ambitious dreamer that an accident will occur and he acknowledges that he was a penniless young man and these are Nick's observations that the invisible cloak of his uniform covers his poverty, that it prevents her from finding out that he is not the man she might suspect he is, poor and unable to support her in the life that she might otherwise enjoy. He took what he could get. Look here at this word, to take. It doesn't ask, it's not shared, it's a clutching at, a grabbing, an ownership. He could He's ravenous, he's starving for it. And it tells us here he's unscrupulous. So he doesn't consider the morality of his choice. It's because he wants it. And perhaps here Fitzgerald's telling us that because we are pursuing this dream, that we don't necessarily consider the moral boundaries that we might be crossing in taking money and becoming wealthy and working hard to have it and achieving our dreams at the expense of others. Eventually he took Daisy one still October night, took her because he had no real right to touch her hand. And it's interesting that it's in October in the Northern Hemisphere. This is autumn, the end of a life and not the beginning. So there is that foreshadowing that there is the death of their relationship. Um, he realises that he couldn't take care of her. He doesn't have the comfortable home and the standing behind him. Um, and that he is at the whim of others in ways that Tom Buchanan isn't. Tom Buchanan blows into Daisy's life with pomp and ceremony and cars and expensive pearls. Whereas... Um, Gatsby is at the whim of the government as a soldier. But he doesn't despise himself, and it doesn't turn out as he imagines. But in being with her, he has committed himself to the following of a grail. Now we know what the holy grail is, this idea of finding um, the cup of Jesus and having eternal life. And for him, Pursuing Daisy, pursuing the dream, is the promise of always being happy, that grail. He didn't realise how extraordinary 
beyond ordinary, beyond our belief a nice girl could be. And what makes her? She was rich. She has a full life and a rich house. And for Gatsby, those become the symbols of happiness and success. And he felt married to her. Now, not necessarily Daisy the girl, but the things that she might represent. When they meet to, again, to when they met two day, again two days later, it was Gatsby who was breathless. He was um, somehow who was somehow betrayed. Her porch was bright with the bought luxury of starshine. So here is this now committed young man seeing the star shine on her porch and seeing it as the magic of being with Daisy. Um, she kisses him, um, but she caught a cold. Now that's that symbol of illness that might come with this autumn weather and the death of the relationship in reality, but it is juxtaposition with this dream that Gatsby will ultimately continue to pursue. Uh, Gatsby was overwhelmingly aware of the youth and mystery that wealth imprisons and preserves of the freshness of many clothes and of Daisy gleaming like silver, safe and proud above the hot struggles of the poor. There she was, out of his reach, beyond him, and it imprisoned him this idea of desiring something so much more beautiful than the existence that he had. Um, on, I'm jumping here too. On the last afternoon before he went abroad, he sat with Daisy in his arms for a long silent time and it was a cold fall day. There's that pathetic fallacy. It should have been the end, the death of a relationship and an idea. But it also becomes the death of Gatsby's possibility of moving on and he is now wedded to this ambition. Notice here, they were only in love for a month. So it's quite a short-lived romance. Now, I quite like this section of the novel because you get a sense of Daisy picking herself up, being practical and moving on with her life. She's young. Her artificial world was redolent of orchids and pleasant cheerful snobbery and orchestras which set the rhythm of the year, summing up the sadness and suggestiveness of life in new tunes. Change, movement, ambition. Unlike Gatsby who remains still in his ambition, she moved on. They talk about her. Pairs, the pairs of golden and silver slippers, this golden wealthy life, that shuffled the shining dust. There, that idea of shining, glittery gold, desirable. But it's also dust, has very little promise. It is not something you wed yourself to. It is not the rock. It, she drifted like rose petals blown by the sad horns around the floor. The twilight universe, Daisy began to move again. In the twilight universe, Daisy begins to move with the seasons. There's a change, a shift. She's a young girl. She ends up with dozens of men dancing on at, in dates and the nights are punctuated with evening dresses tangled amongst dying orchids on the floor beside her bed. So these aren't beautiful images. She does blossom, but there is a, an ugly underside to a life that is empty. And she tells us she wanted her life shaped now, immediately, and the decision must be made by some, by some force of love, of money, of unquestionable practicality. And that's what drives Daisy, that line. And of course we find out what that force is, and that's Tom Buchanan that force of love, money and practicality that will save her when she commits the terrible crime in the novel. There was a wholesome bulkiness about his person and his position and Daisy was flattered. And therein is the wedding of two characters who will 
survive